Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our weekly webinar here at the Endurance Hub. Uh, good to be back with you. Um, we'll just give people a little bit of time here to sign in. Um, today's topic is uh, similar to last week's topic. We're going to dive into some bike lingo this time. So last week we covered swim lingo. Uh, we went through a whole bunch of different terms that you might run into. Uh, on the pool deck uh, or at the open water session. Uh, I know for me, when I was first getting into the sport, uh, one of the most challenging things was learning a new language. Uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of terms that came up uh, through swimming, biking, and running. Uh, and in, initially, uh, it was a little intimidating because I didn't really know what people were talking about. Uh, but with time, of course, you learn the language and uh, then it becomes much easier to listen to the coach uh, you know, on the swim deck or uh, at the run session or, or on the bike. Uh, certainly the same goes if you're getting an online program, uh, there might be some language in there that you're not really understanding. And so the goal of today is to dive into a little bit of bike lingo, uh, share some of the terminology with you and hopefully give you uh, a little bit of the language to work with so that you're not sitting there wondering what uh, everything and everybody is talking about. Okay, well, let's let's dive in here. I uh, have another slide presentation for you. Um, again, if you, if you aren't able to join live, uh, you can dive into uh, previous webinars. This is number four in our series. It's an ongoing series. And you can find all the old webinars uh, on our website, uh, b78endurancehub.com. Uh, and you'll be able to find the the old webinars in there, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, obviously, we have the master classes. Uh, if you don't know much about those, you can find out about them on the website. A really tremendous uh, um, series of master classes uh, featuring myself uh, and then some other experts in their field uh, covering nutrition, sports psychology, recovery. Uh, the master classes are awesome. Uh, they are in short little uh, pieces from about 5 to 15 minutes. And the speakers really are extraordinary. I mean, they're leaders in their field, but also uh, sports specific. Um, for example, our nutritionist is Dr. Kim McQueen, and she works with uh, Rowing Canada and Rugby Canada, uh, lots of national team athletes. Uh, she was instrumental in helping me work through my nutrition issues uh, as a pro triathlete. Uh, she's really exceptional, and and her series is an example of several that we have on the B78 Endurance Hub. Okay, let's dive in here. Uh, hopefully, everybody can see this. Okay, so today, we're going to talk about bike lingo. Let's dive right in. So I thought it would be uh, prudent first and foremost, to just go through the different types of bikes that you might run into. So if you're new to this sport, uh, you might be a little overwhelmed by the vast number of bicycles available. We always make a joke that uh, the appropriate number of bicycles for you is N plus one, which means take the number of bikes that you currently have in your garage and add one every time. Um, this is, uh, this is a very common practice by hardcore triathletes in particular. Uh, lots of different bike varieties that you can get your hands on. Certainly if you're a gear, uh, a, a gear aficionado and you really like tech, then the, the bike space is going to be one of your favorites. Uh, bike technology has come a long way. Uh, you know, the, the types of materials we use to build frames and the aerodynamic uh, setups on these bikes is is really amazing. Today, I wanted to keep it a little bit simple and just show you a few of the different bike options that there are. Um, now, obviously, if you're going to get into triathlon, if you're just starting, you know you can you'll be fine with one bike. And I always say to people, if you're a true beginner in the sport, you know all you need is any kind of bike, really. Uh, just pick a short race so that you're not having to do a 180 kilometer Ironman bike ride on, uh, you know, a rusted old commuter bike. Uh, you don't want that. That won't be much fun for you. Um, but certainly if you have even a mountain bike or, you know, a commuter bike or a road bike, uh, if you don't have a triathlon specific bike, that's okay. 
you can still dive in and uh, do a short race uh, successfully and, uh, you know, not have to be out of pocket for something that you, you know, if it gets sticky for you and you, you hang around in the sport, then by all means, start investing in something that's a little higher end. Uh, if financially, uh, there's, there's no, uh, barriers for you, then you'll love the bike space because there's lots of different options and different bikes can be used at different times of the year. Let's start with, uh, the very traditional road bike. So you'll see top left, uh, in the, in this little, these little pictures, uh, this is a very traditional road bike setup. Um, you'll see it's got two triangles, one bigger one at the front and one at the back. Most bikes fall into this category. They're very simple design, two triangles. Triangles are very strong structure. Um, but you will see bikes called beam bikes, which uh, do not have this setup. Uh, there's a few different bike manufacturers making pretty cool looking, they almost look like little rocket ships. Um, and they, you, you know, you won't see those two triangles. They'll set it up a different way. But by and large, you know, these, uh, this setup is, is what you're going to see on the bike. So that top left one is a standard road bike. The top right is a time trial bike or a triathlon bike. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as a TT bike, which is basically just time trial. And, you know, in the, these two examples here, so the two top bikes, you won't see too much of a difference aside from the handlebar setup. So if you look at the front of the bike there above the front wheel, that is the biggest difference in these two bikes. So a time trial bike will have what are called aero bars. And I have some, some pictures of that in, uh, in slides coming up and the road bike on the left will have a traditional, what we call a, a drop style bar or drop bar. Um, and really this is just so you can get into different positions. Uh, and there's a safety component as well. So typically on a road bike, uh, they'll have this drop style handlebar. Uh, because it's a bit safer. So your hand position is always somewhere close to the brakes, which is really, really important because most of the time on the road bike or some of the time on a road bike, you're riding with other people. And so you need to have pretty quick access to your brakes. So your hands are always in a position that allow for, uh, you know, quick braking if it's needed. Now on a time trial bike, that's not the case. So your hands will actually go into what we call an arrow position, which is your hands will be out in front. You can see this position here, they'll be out in front. And the brake levers are actually down on uh, the handlebar part of uh, those bars. So, you know, in a time trial, uh, we're factoring in that maybe people are spread apart a little bit more, so you're not in close quarters. Um, so the, the need for immediate braking hopefully is less. Now, you know, if you're just getting started and you have a, a, a time trial setup or a time trial bike, you need to be particularly mindful of what's happening up the road. Uh, you always need to be looking ahead. Your, your line of sight needs to be down the road as opposed to immediately in front of you so that you can anticipate problems that might be arising. It's very, very important that if you're in that position where your hands are not uh, at quick access to the brakes, that um, you know what's coming. And another rule of thumb is if you are riding in a group with other people, you should not be in the aero position. Now you might see uh, time trials at the Olympic Games or the Tour de France, where there are teams of athletes, teams of riders, riding in close quarters on those bars. Now these are very high-end professional athletes. They're very predictable, they're very quick, um, you know, they just have a better feel maybe for the bike. So, but if you're just getting started and you have a time trial bike and you're with a group of cyclists, you know, cyclists, unless you're at the front and nobody's in front of you, uh, you should probably not be on those time trial bars. You should have your hands covering the brakes. Let's check out gravel bikes. That's a fairly new thing in the last five, 10 years. Uh, really there's gravel bikes and cycle cross bikes, and you might not be able to see much of a difference between those two bikes. Basically they look like a traditional road bike. Uh, the handlebar setup at the front is what we call it a drop bar. Um, cycle cross bikes though are designed more for cycle cross racing, which is a little bit more aggressive. So the tires might be a little bit smaller, a little less width in the tires. And a gravel bike really is designed for kind of long haul gravel riding. It's become really popular in the last uh, couple of years. Um, tons of fun. 
Uh, you can access all kinds of roads that you wouldn't be able to on a normal road bike. Uh, the tires are quite a bit thicker. They're actually like really old school mountain bike tires. Um, and you'll also notice if you can kind of zoom in on that picture or you do a Google search for a gravel bike, the handlebars are kind of swept out a little bit uh, on the side. So the drop part of the drop bar is swept out a little differently than a road bike. Uh, my tech savvy uh, issues continue. <laughs> you'll see that I think my own head is covering the picture of the mountain bike. Uh, just do a Google search for mountain bike and you'll get thousands of images. Mountain bike is a very different setup, uh, much more laid back bike. The handlebar situation is very different. And usually there is some suspension with a mountain bike. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see, uh, you know, maybe a fork at the front uh, that has some suspension and maybe in the back as well. Um, so those are the four different types of bike. Uh, well, actually, there's five in here. There are other types of bikes. Obviously, there's electric bikes now. There's commuter bikes, but you know this group of bikes here. You know, if you're getting into triathlon or multi-sport road biking, uh, these are the bikes you're most likely to come across, and probably most likely desire at some point. Okay, let's move on. Um, I know for me, one of the the most challenging things initially was the the different parts of a bike. I found that a little bit intimidating. Uh, so I thought I'd give you a little schematic here of, uh, the different, uh, seat to the different tubes, uh, and the different sort of names of things on the bike outside of the most obvious, which are the wheels and the handlebars and the seat. So when you look at a bike, we, we looked at, uh, the previous slide there, it has two triangles. So you can see that pretty predominantly here. Now, if you go to that back triangle, the one on the left, looking at the screen, uh, the bottom part of the triangle is called the seat stay. So this is the part of the bike that goes from the crank arms that you'll see where the, the pedals go around uh, back to the back wheel. So that is, sorry, that is the chain stay. Did I call it the seat stay? It's the chain stay. The easiest way to remember that is it goes in, it's parallel really to the chain. Uh, so that is called the chain stay. Now the seat stay is uh, on the left side of that triangle and it's the one that goes up to the seat. That's how I remember it. Uh, so that is the, the seat stay goes up to the seat. The other tube that makes up uh, the third side of that triangle is called the seat tube. Again, really easy to remember that one because it's the tube that runs from the seat. Um, across the top, so you, now we're looking at the right triangle. Across the top it is called the top tube. Super easy. They're well named. Uh, once you get a handle of it, they're they're very well named. Um, and then of course, making up that, uh, that triangle on the right, we also have the seat tube. So top tube, seat tube, and then that third side of that, that, uh, right hand triangle, uh, is called the down tube. Um, and, uh, so that makes up, uh, that second triangle. Now the seat tube obviously is shared by both triangles. I mentioned in the previous slide that the triangle is, is really the go-to shape for bicycles because it's a very strong, uh, it's a very strong shape. Uh, you'll notice at the front of the bike, there's two other, uh, terms I wanted to throw at you. One is the head tube. Okay. So you'll see that's at the very top there. Now it kind of, it almost actually from this picture makes that second triangle look more, look less like a triangle and more like a four sided thing. But, um, the head tube really is where the handlebars go into. And then the last part there is the fork. So the fork is at the front of the bike. And that's really what attaches that front wheel to the bike itself. So again, if you're confused after this slide, just do a Google search for, you could probably say bike construction or, you know, what are the tubes on a bike? And it'll, it'll give you something like this and you can, you can check it out. Okay. Let's go through some basic equipment here. Uh, again, if you are uh, not new to this sport, some of this stuff is going to be uh, a little boring, but still, if you're brand new, then this is uh, some useful information. So top left helmet, uh, you're going to see all different kinds of helmets, but usually for triathlon or road biking, they're going to look something like that top left picture, pretty basic, uh, nothing fancy going on there. Uh, you'll see there's what look like holes in there. Those are vents so that it's not just a solid structure on your head, your head, like a, 
you know, a hockey or a football helmet, uh, you know, you want some ventilation, especially if you're riding hard and fast in the summer and it's getting hot, you'll be thankful for that ventilation. Um, one kind of neat thing about bike helmets is they really are designed in a way to break around your head. So if you fall, the helmet is designed to crack and break around your head. So it's designed to take the impact, uh, much like a, a car is, you know, if you get into a car accident, the car is designed to break around you. Uh, it's designed to take that force so that the force doesn't go through you. Um, and that's really important. Uh, I say that because if you do get into a bike crash uh, and the helmet uh, hits the ground, uh, hopefully your head is okay. But you should always replace that helmet because the integrity of the helmet might be uh, no good anymore. Uh, any kind of crack in there has has sort of ruined the integrity of the helmet. So you need to be really careful with that. You also need to be careful not to drop it. So if you're just carrying your helmet to the car or something and it drops on the pavement, you should have a good look at it. I mean, you know, you, you might want to take it to a bike shop and see what they say. Um, because really, they, as I said, they are designed to sort of break around you if there is a fall. Um, okay, next up, gloves. Uh, most cycling gloves do not have fingers. Uh, in the winter, of course, you can get uh, fingered gloves, but most of the time in the summer, cycling gloves do not have fingers. It's probably a heat thing. You know, a, a long fingered glove in the summer might get really warm. This will cool you off a little bit. Gloves are really important. Uh, again, from a crash standpoint, if you do go down, you want to protect your hands, and these gloves will do that. Uh, furthermore, if you are on a three, four, five hour bike ride, these gloves typically have a little bit of padding in the palm, which is really nice. Uh, so they're, you know, they, they protect the hands a little bit while you're doing the long rides as well, protect from blisters, and they're just a little bit more comfy. Highly recommend that you wear gloves. I think for the first five years of my road biking, I never wore gloves because I didn't really understand. I was like, I don't need gloves. It's the summertime. Um, but if you crash and the hands go out, uh, the last thing you want is your hands really beaten up because you won't really be able to do much else. Uh, cooking, working at a computer, whatever you do uh, is is not really fun if your hands have a whole bunch of road rash on them. So really important to, to pick up a, a nice set of gloves. Uh, a chamois. So uh, you'll see that bottom left picture. Those are some bike shorts that are turned inside out so you can see the chamois. Now, if you see a group of cyclists, you'll notice uh, usually wearing a lot of spandex or lycra. Um, and inside the shorts are what we call a chamois. Now the chamois is uh, some padding uh, that basically makes it more comfortable for, comfortable for you to sit on the bike seat. Uh, you'll notice road bikes, racing bikes in particular, the seats are not uh, large plush seats that you, you put your bum on. They're, they're quite aggressive. You do get used to them. Um, and then they get comfortable. But these sh the chamois in these shorts just adds a layer of uh, padding and protection so that the ride is a little bit more comfortable. I can tell you from experience, I when I was first riding, I never knew where, whether I was supposed to wear underwear under my <laughs> shorts. <laughs> um, so I think for the first year, I wore underwear under my shorts. Uh, that is, a, you do not need to do that. It's very uncomfortable. And these shorts are designed to be worn uh, without underwear. So if you're wondering that, sometimes that's a tricky question for people. They don't know and they don't want to ask. Well, I'm telling you, you don't need underwear under the bike shorts. Um, and then last uh, little bit of equipment that you might come across are what are, are, are called clipless pedals. So again, I've made the mistake of putting my face right over that picture. Do a search for clipless pedals and you'll get a thousand images uh, that show you what they are. Basically, uh, bike pedals are kind of like a ski uh, binding, if you're familiar with skiing. Uh, basically, they have a little uh, metal piece on the bottom and you will clip your foot into those pedals. Now, you'll also see in this picture, uh, it's called a platform pedal. This is not clipped in, it's just for reference so that you can see the difference. But a clip-in pedal or a clipless pedal is one where you actually uh, clip your foot into the pedal. Now, if you're a beginner, uh, this might feel a little intimidating because it's gonna feel like your feet are locked into the pedal. 
highly recommend that you take your bike to a grassy field and get used to uh, putting your foot in. It'll feel like it's locked in, but it's not. Uh, most pedal design requires only that you make a small twist to the left or the right, and that foot will click out. So you'll be you'll be able to get your foot out. And that reaction uh, to unclip your pedal from the clipless pedal uh, becomes very natural and very quick. So if you're coming to a stoplight or a stop sign, you'll get used to very quickly unclipping that foot and being able to put it down. Uh, but clipless pedals, uh, certainly a very important part of road biking and triathlon because it allows you to generate a lot more power than you would otherwise uh, just on a flat pedal because it allows you to, your leg is, is kind of locked into the pedal. So now you can pull up the back of the pedal stroke, push across the top, there's just a lot more places that you can engage around uh, the pedaling circle, which will ultimately help you produce more power and have a smoother pedal stroke. Okay, let's talk about a few pieces of equipment that uh, you do not need initially, uh, but if you catch the bug of you know doing triathlon, Ironman, half Ironman events, and you show up to some of these events, you're gonna see some pretty, uh, fancy gear and if you really get the bug chances are you're going to want to get some of this stuff um so top left those are time trial bars so you remember the first slide i showed uh with the different bikes well this is the type of bar setup that you would have at the front of a triathlon bike or a time trial bike or a tt bike as we call it so again um the gearing typically on these is on the long piece of the bar there so your hands will be up in like a skiing tuck position and you'll be able to shift your gears from there but the brake levers will be on those shorter uh, wider part of the bar there so again as I mentioned uh, when you're in the time trial position your hands are nowhere near the brakes uh, so you have to be very aware and typically if you're climbing or certainly if you're in groups you'll want to have your hands on the on the part of the bar uh, where the brakes are um so drop bars uh just for reference the picture top right is uh, a bike with drop bars just so you can see the difference again um, and on those drop bars you'll see uh brake hoods so you might hear the term hoods and what they're referring to are the part of the, the handlebar where the brakes attach and that's a very comfortable place to actually put your hands on the brake hoods bottom left you'll see an aero helmet uh, you'll see lots of different types of helmets. Now, the one I'm showing you there is actually a little bit old, old school. Some of the newer aero helmets do not have that long tail out the back. Uh, they're always changing and adapting based on what they find out in wind tunnel testing and maybe what the computer modeling will tell them. Um, but I showed you this picture because it's quite striking. It's quite different from a normal helmet. Uh, and that would be called an aero helmet or a time trial helmet. You can even see this one has little dots on the front of it, if you can see. Uh, those are dimples, and I think at one time they were mimicking what a golf ball has on them because a, a golf ball has dimples, I believe, uh, because it makes it more aerodynamic. Uh, and I think they're doing the same thing with this helmet. So again, companies are always trying to innovate, uh, find ways uh, to make their products stand out from other products. And um, yeah. And then uh, bottom right, uh, we'll just call these race wheels. Uh, again, if you're brand new to the sport, you're going to be shocked at the, the amount of equipment that you can purchase. It's, it's fun. <laughs> um, so race wheels, you'll see they're very different than a traditional wheel just on a road bike. Uh, lots of carbon. Uh, these, this particular wheel set is, is designed by a company that's very famous in the triathlon world. Um, and you'll see the back wheel is completely solid. So we call that a disc wheel and disc wheels are very, very fast, they're very aerodynamic. And then the other wheel beside it would be a front wheel. And we would call this a deep dish wheel. And you'll see that the carbon sort of around, you'll still, still see spokes there, but you'll see a very wide piece of carbon that, that, uh, encircles the wheel as well. And there are varying uh, depths of deep dish wheels, if you want to call it that. So um, y y sometimes you'll see uh, more of the wheel covered. It'll look more and more like a disc. 
uh, or less and less. And there's there's pros and cons to having either. You know, the 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 more of the wheel that you have filled in, uh, the more susceptible you are to crosswinds. You know, can you if you can imagine having a disc on the front of your bike, which is illegal in most races unless you're on the track. And the reason for that it's a safety concern. If you get a crosswind, it it acts like a sail, and that can be pretty disastrous. So you need to make smart wheel choices when you're racing. But we're talking a little bit higher level here. And uh, for now, we'll just leave you with a picture of those beautiful race wheels so you can dream about getting some of those on your bike. Let's talk about two other terms that are really important if you're getting into biking, RPM and cadence, basically the, the exact same thing, just two different ways to say the same thing. RPM stands for revolutions per minute. Uh, if you are into cars, uh, and you have maybe like a tricked out roadster or something, you might have an RPM um, thing or a standard, an old standard car. Uh, uh, oh, good question. I just had a question from someone in our chat room, which is great. How much do those wheels typically cost? That is such a great question. Um, and thanks for asking it. There is a massive range. Uh, these wheels, probably for a good wheel set, you could get up to three, 4,000 bucks for a good wheel set. Um, but I think now that there's more competition in the space, my guess is you can kind of bring those, you probably get a decent wheel for 800 to a thousand bucks. So maybe a couple of them for close to a couple thousand bucks. They're not cheap. Um, but as I said, there's lots of more competition coming into the space and, uh, you know, there's probably a variation, but then also there's a variation in quality as well. Um, but thanks for that question. I'll do a little digging and see what the price range is um for those wheels that's a good question okay so back to rpm and cadence so same thing revolutions per minute cadence is just another way to say it uh just uh, a way to describe how how many revolutions uh per minute uh your feet are going around um so we we count this number a lot because it's relevant for uh pedaling mechanics and how much effort we're putting out and uh, as we'll get into a little bit later in some of the other episodes, I think I have a slide coming up as well. Um, the way we produce wattage, we get there through torque and cadence or RPM. So uh, if you want to produce 300 watts, you need to have a combination of uh, a certain amount of torque. So how hard are you pushing on the pedals as well as how fast are you spinning your legs? So RPM and cadence, if you're a new uh, triathlete, new cyclist, this is uh, a metric that most computers will have. You can even get really cheap bike computers, 40, 50 bucks. You know, they won't be Bluetooth kind of Garmin things, but they should have a cadence sensor. And it's a really good number to start tuning into and paying attention to. And often coaches will specify uh, the specific RPM or cadence that they want you at. So again, this is just how many times is one foot going around the pedal circle every minute. Okay, let's see here. Next slide. Big gear. So you might hear uh, the term big gear thrown around. This basically just means that you're in a big gear. Uh, it sounds obvious, but sometimes bike sets will be structured in a way that uh, you're in a big gear and at a low cadence. And so you're kind of, uh, it, it does serve a certain purpose, but um, for now I won't get into that. But if you hear the term big gear, it just means that you're in a big gear, usually at a low cadence. And uh, again, as it, it elicits a specific training effect that we like, um, and we'll get into that later. Spinning is kind of the opposite of that. So again, if you're new and you hear the word spinning, it just means usually you're in a lighter gear and the RPM is a little bit higher. If a coach or somebody says, hey, you're mashing gears, usually that means you're in too big of a gear um, and they want you to lighten the gear up a little bit. Uh, you know, mashing gears is, is quite common in beginner cyclists because uh, it's easier to pedal slower. It's easier to be in a bigger gear with the RPM lower because there's a coordination part of it. Um, but ultimately we wanna work the RPM up a little bit higher uh, while keeping it smooth um, and not mashing gears. Uh, 
Single leg work, uh, single leg is simply that. So I talked about clipless pedals earlier. And one thing that allows is for you to literally pedal with one leg. And some coaches will give you uh, sets where you literally pedal with one leg and they'll call that single leg uh, pedaling or single leg work. Okay, getting a little higher level now, uh, but let's dive in here. You'll hear in reference to cycling, uh, the term watts or watts per kilo a lot. Now, watts are simply a measure of how much effort you're putting out on the bike. The way we get to wattage, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is through cadence. So how fast are your legs spinning around the circle? And torque, how much, uh, how hard are you pushing on the pedals? So that is how we get to wattage. That is how they equate, um, they find out what wattage you're pedaling or what wattage you're pushing. Uh, m a lot of bike computers uh, now will measure wattage, but you need to have a strain gauge somewhere on the bike. And that will either be found in the crank arm, so in the part where the pedals are attached to. Sometimes they're in the back wheel. Sometimes they're in the pedals themselves. Lots of innovation there. Um, they're not all created equal. Some are better and more accurate than others. Uh, if you're a beginner, you certainly don't need to get uh, a power meter. That's the last uh, term on this page. But if you're really into the numbers and maybe money is no object and you're keen to get everything, then a power meter is a great tool. Uh, so again, wattage is probably the most pure measure of effort that you can have on the bike. Uh, wattage doesn't care what temperature it is. It doesn't care if you're going uphill, downhill, and it's very in the moment. And by that, I mean, uh, if you are pedaling along, uh, you might be pedaling, say at 200 Watts. If you stop pedaling, you will be pedaling at zero Watts. So you can go from producing a whole bunch of power to no power right away, just by not pedaling. Um, so in that way, it's a very pure measure of effort where something like heart rate has a lag time. So you know, if you're pedaling along and your heart rate's 140, if you stop pedaling, it's going to be 140 and then it's going to go 139, 138. It's going to drop very slowly. Um, so it's not as accurate in terms of in the moment, uh, what is my effort? Watts per kilogram is simply the amount of wattage that you can produce per kilogram. And this is relevant uh, when we get to hill climbing, right? So uh, if you're climbing up a hill, it's more important to have a higher watts per, per kilogram than just outright wattage. So a great example is I used to uh, train with some uh, heavyweight rowers. These were very, very high-end rowers. Um, big, big human beings. Very, very strong. Uh, we would get on the bike and they could produce a massive amount of wattage, right? So we're on the flats and we're time trialing, they could just destroy pretty much anybody. Uh, and that includes high-end uh, Canadian national team cyclists. They were incredible. Um, they were big. They could produce a lot of wattage. But as soon as we started going uphill, their watts per kilo uh, were less impressive. Uh, and that's because they were just bigger human beings. So yes, they could produce a lot of wattage, but when you reference that, to how heavy they were, uh, going uphill was more challenging. Uh, whereas a smaller rider like myself, I could not produce very, very many watts on the flats. It was very unimpressive, but my watts per kilo were quite high. So as soon as we started climbing, uh, I would look much more impressive than I would on the flats. This is why in big cycling events like the Tour de France, you'll see very different types of riders who excel uh, on flatter stages or time trial stages uh, or on the hilly stages. And then obviously the sprinters are an entirely different uh, type of athlete as well. Um, so watts and watts per kilo, important numbers to pay attention to and uh, very, very useful um, to get used to them if you're going to dive a little deeper into this sport. Talked about it before, but torque and cadence. So torque is simply how hard am I pushing on the pedals? And cadence is how fast am I spinning my legs around? And then a power meter is just a device that measures all that. 
Uh, in in the initial days of power meters, we were paying three to four thousand dollars for a power meter because there was no competition in in that space. Um, and we did it because we kind of wanted to have all the numbers. Now you can get decent power meters, you know, through the pedals or on the back wheel, or you know, there's one sided uh, uh, power meters like that, just one side of the crank, um, the crank arm. Uh, and they're they're much cheaper, I think, probably anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars. So that's been great. It's been a great equalizer. It's allowed many more people to get into the 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 power meter market. Uh, and it's certainly, you know, if you have a good coach who's programming using power, it's really great. It's just such a beautiful uh, measurement of how hard you're going. Okay, I think this is the last slide. Uh, let's talk about a few more terms that are important for uh, your entry into triathlon or bike training. Uh, drafting. So drafting is basically when you are riding behind uh, another rider and close enough that the they are breaking the wind for you, so to speak. Um, so if you if you ride fairly close to another athlete's back wheel, uh, it's a massive advantage because they are creating what we call a slipstream. Uh, they're breaking the wind ahead. Now, certainly this is exaggerated if you're going into a headwind. Now that front rider is going to be doing quite a bit more of the work and you can, what we say, sit on their wheel and just take a nice little break. You'll notice in high level cycling, they take turns at the front. So they're spreading out the workload. Drafting is something that you need to get comfortable with if you're going to ride with other with groups of people. If you're a true beginner and you're getting on the bike for the first time, I'm not encouraging you to suddenly just jump on the back of someone's wheel. Um, you need to ease your way into it. Uh, you know, getting with a group that has a beginner uh, a, a beginner part of the group is useful with a coach that can kind of ease you in there and give you some tips on on safe ways to draft. Uh, it would be a good idea. If you're a veteran cyclist, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, let's talk a, a, about a couple things specific to triathlon. Uh, draft legal uh, basically means that the event allows drafting. Uh, now, you'll see this mostly at the higher levels. So the Olympic Games, the triathlon is draft legal. All the World Cup races are draft legal. This, uh, the first time they had it in the Olympics was in 2000. And that was uh, in the early years of draft legal racing. They were having such a difficult time monitoring the drafting uh, situation because you'd have 50 athletes out on a course. They'd all get out of the water together. And how are they supposed to spread apart? It was very, very difficult. And you'll see this if you're into Ironman or 70.3 racing. It's really hard to spread out a thousand riders on the same road. It's almost impossible. So ultimately... You get groups that come together and it's just really hard to uh, get people to spread apart. Uh, so for the higher level World Cup short course, sort of Olympic distance racing, they just said, let's make it draft legal. And it's really exciting. And it, it required a, a new skill set. And it's, you know, stood the test of time. We're 22 years roughly into that now. If you are a draft illegal race, which is most long distance races like Ironman or 70.3 events, they will have what's called a drafting zone. And different races have different uh, spacing between riders. So they'll basically just say, look, the, the rider in front, you have to be five, seven, 10 meters behind that rider. There will be drafting marshals out there. It's a rough estimate at best. Like, you know, you're riding along at 40K an hour it's sometimes tricky to evaluate how close you are to another rider. But if the race has established that it's seven meters, then you should go and look at what seven meters looks like. Uh, it's quite far. Um, now, you know, it's up to you to know that distance and it becomes a judgment call. If there's a draft marshal and you're, you know, 6.9 meters behind a rider, they're probably going to be fine with it. If you're three meters behind the rider, they're going to call call you out for sure, and you'll get a drafting penalty. So you have to err on the side of caution. Um, and often draft marshals will give you a little warning first if they think you're too close, and they'll give you an opportunity to back off. Um, but really, it's up to you to make sure the spacing 
uh, is appropriate so that you don't get a penalty. So those are all my terms for today. Uh, thanks for ja uh, joining us, James. Thanks for the question. And uh, I'll dive in a little bit and, and find out how much, how much race wheels cost these days. My guess, if I had to, is anywhere from one to three or 4,000 for a good set. Um, I think the used market's usually a pretty decent place for that too, as long as they're good. You know, race wheels don't get used a lot, uh, usually just in, in races. So, oh, one more question. Yeah, go for it. Throw it my way. What have you got for me? How much would a beginner bike cost if I have not done a triathlon yet? That's a really good question. Uh, how much would a bike cost if I haven't done a triathlon yet? So first and foremost, I think you need to decide whether you want to get a triathlon specific bike. So a time trial bike, if you think that you're going to get stuck into this sport, uh, and you know, maybe you have long-term goals of, you know, I'm going to do a short race this year, maybe a half, and then maybe a full in a couple of years. I certainly would recommend going down the time trial route because those longer races are much better on a time trial bike. Um, but cost wise, I would definitely go with a used bike to start. You're going to be in a much more, uh, favorable position financially if you go the used route. Now, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that uh, that means it's going to be cheap. Bikes these days are quite expensive. So let's start at the high end. If you want to get a brand new, fully dialed in high end time trial bike, you're probably up around 15,000 bucks, which is a lot. I mean, that's like, that's what I bought my Nissan Leaf for. <laughs> so, but so let's start there at one extreme. At the other extreme, you can probably get in a, a decent used bike that's maybe say a decade old, like somebody selling off a bike they had in 2010 or 2012 or something, uh, you know, with a time trial set up for probably a couple thousand bucks to 2,500 bucks, maybe even cheaper. Um, so I think, you know, that's probably your range, a couple grand all the way up to 15,000. Um, if you're not keen on a time trial bike, you probably get a road bike for a little bit cheaper than that. Um, and again, the, the used market is, is where to go if budget is, is an issue. I think if you walk into a bike store too, they're probably going to give you a, a range of, you know, on a road bike scene, probably anywhere from two, 2,500 all the way up again to about 15,000 for new, like you probably get a pretty decent, uh, new bike for two to 3000 bucks would be my guess. You're not going to get super high end components for that. Um, but it's new. So you know, there should be a guarantee that there's not no issues with it. Um, anyway, so that, that would be my guess. Uh, I would start poking around and, and just seeing, seeing what's out there on the used market first and take it from there. Thumbs up for that, James. Okay. Um, well, thanks. Thanks for jumping in. And uh, hopefully that was informative. Again, if you want to see some of our previous webinars, you can go check them out at the B78 Endurance Hub. And uh, yeah, you're welcome, James. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, if you have any suggestions on other stuff you want to learn about, please, please let us know. And we're happy to tailor these webinars, uh, you know, to what people want as well. Okay, everybody, safe training this week, and we'll see you next week.